and this is a cool picture. I mean, I, I, when I was putting this presentation together, I was trying to think of a a person or a some, somebody who personified power. And even though, despite the the result last weekend, uh, you know, this man is the man. You know, he's he's the man that has brought that kind of power even further into the to the boxing world. I know we had like Mike Tyson and and whatnot, but you know, without question. Pac-Man is, is a legend in my eyes and, and a good character as well, somebody who does seem to to do good with his with his earnings and, and whatnot that he that he's got there and, and tries to improve and, and develop the sport. So quite a cool little picture there for you. And ultimately I deliberately called this presentation something that would potentially spark a few things there, forget strength, let's build power. Well, you know, that's not necessarily the entire equation, but really and truly, you know, power is where it's at for me. And um, when we're talking about winning as a performer, it's got to be qualities that are related to power that, that tend to kind of make the difference there. And I'm going to talk a little bit more more about that. So, but thanks again for, for, for joining me. It's, it's always a pleasure to, to get so many people on the line. We had, I think we had nearly 300 people uh, registered for the webinar tonight, so it's, it's really cool. Last, last week or the other week when we did the Building the Performance program, we had about, I think we had over 700 on that one. So it's, uh, it's awesome, you know, it's really cool. And to, to sit there on, on your sofa or whatever you are uh, is a pretty cool thing that we can bring, bring people together like this. And wherever you are in the world, whether it's good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, it's all about improving and getting better. So hopefully I can share some things. And, and it's not all about me, this talk. There's a lot of work in from other people as well. So let's see if my slides move on. So big thumbs up to you guys. I, I love this slide. It, it really is about getting you together. I wouldn't be sitting here talking to myself. Well, I might be, actually, because I'm a little bit of a nerd. But... Um, but no, it's it's great to be able to share things, and, and it's a pleasure, and, and I really do appreciate you tuning in today. A little bit about me, for those of you not aware and, and whatnot, I've been coaching and uh, involved in strength and conditioning and, and athletic preparation, I guess, for many years now, probably almost 15 years, and I've been a, a full-time S&C coach for about 10, and I, st I started off as a martial artist. Did a lot of MMA, boxing, judo, and then I moved into your classic Brazilian jiu-jitsu and wrestling and those type of martial arts, as well as Thai boxing. Trained in Thailand, trained all over the States with some really, really top guys out there. And that, when I was younger, that was that was the goal, that was the passion. It was to be a, a full-time martial artist, to open my own gym, to, but also, also to be a coach. I always knew that I wanted to be a coach. And... I went to uni and I started studying and got interested more in the physical preparation side of things and read some articles by both Vern Gambetta and Charlie Francis and it just fascinated me the depth of of, of what I could get to with, with physical preparation work and strength and conditioning. And so that was really there my passion and and since then I've been genuinely fortunate to work with some really cool athletes and organizations and and people right up to the very, very top with the Olympians and, uh, and, and also young people, students. And, and in terms of the diversity, everything from sports like golf to, to sports like disability sports like goalball, uh, fascinating ones to work with, to professional rugby league, to um, mixed martial arts, UFC, to netball, to rugby, to, you know, literally... British tennis in there as well so it's cool because you, you do get to see different cultures and you do get to, to watch different bodies move and that's for me that's what makes you a good coach it's just watching people move and, and, and how they perform their their skills and their movement patterns and just learning from from watching these people over rep after rep week after week year after year it, it's it's very very interesting so hopefully I'll be able to share some of those insights with you today when it comes to power. And we've got a few things on the agenda today. 
Well, I mentioned a little bit at the start, but first thing we'll try and answer quite quickly is, is why power? Why is that important? And I'm going to look at the types of power, the different types of power to familiarize yourself with uh, when you're looking at programming and, and what we need to be aware of. And obviously, if you've got any questions, just feel free to type and ask them. I mentioned in my emails about surfing. You guys got to be able to go surfing. Well, surfing is, is a key word when it comes to power training, and I'm sure some of you know why that might be. Uh, don't worry, you don't have to go down to Scarborough or or, uh, or more glamorous down to Brighton if you if you're one of the southern people, or maybe some of the internationals have got a great beach for surfing. I know people like um, Jeremy Shepherd in in Australia who works with the volleyball and and they actually works with the surfers that's what he does out there he, he lives a he lives the dream you know the surfing dream on the beach but we're going to get surfing for power into today's talk we're going to talk about strength or power either or why you train one over the other and i'm going to try and cover everything on that but if i don't get get to kind of what you're thinking there please do ask because there's a lot to cover and sometimes i, I do miss a, a point or two here and there I'm going to give you some examples of programs, two or three sessions that are really straightforward of how to integrate this stuff. I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview on our mentorship. And I've also got a few little freebies to give away. And I'm going to give them away at the end of the webinar. So stay on the line and you'll get an opportunity to, to get some really cool stuff. And that's the that's the agenda big shout out to, to this man here before we get going does anybody recognize this guy and if you do please type his name in the box who is this man right in front of you right now has had an influence on my development and um, certainly when it comes to power has had a big influence so type type away if you can Yeah, quite a few of you. Yeah, absolutely, and I can. I know Lucas on the line has actually worked, been to a workshop that we hosted with this fella. Uh, keep it coming. Yep, that's the one. That's the one. So it's it's the it's the man himself, Doctor Dan Baker, and I think Victor just mentioned he's not got any sound. So if you want to log out and log back in, uh, that might be a, a worthwhile. Although he probably can't hear me. So Daz, if you want to drop Victor a message, but Dan Baker. Massive, massive influence internationally on power training. And there's a lot of other people as well that have done great, great research on this. People like Jeff McBride in the States and Prue Cormie in Australia. Uh, some of the Jeremy Shepard stuff I mentioned on, on uh, plyometrics and power. But I think Dan Baker for me really has brought home this in a, in a certainly in a team sport context and an applied context and a genuine world leader and we were fortunate to have Dan over for a, a couple of days spent some time with him a year or two ago fantastic workshop so some of the stuff that I'm going to share with you today is, is very much related to, to, to his thoughts and, and obviously my, my take on that as well so if you haven't or if you're not familiar with Dan's work please just familiarize yourself with it because the guy's putting a lot of good stuff out there and he's an ambassador for our mentorship he's going to He's doing some sessions for us this year as well on that. So, so why power? Well, I think we touched on it before at the start, but really a lot of the defining moments that we experience in, in sporting contests, those defining moments are characterized by a, a burst of pace or a powerful movement. And I say power, I'm talking about really rapid actions, whether it's a, a sprint or whether it's a, a an agility-based movement or whether it's a powerful kind of contact-based movement. But ultimately, what we're trying to develop in the, in the gym and as a program is power. And yes, it's underpinned with certain other physical qualities, and we'll get into that as well. But the reality is that we've got to prepare people to, to produce power on the field or on the court or, or however it may be, we've got to develop the ability to produce power under fatigue or power endurance, you might want to call it. 
as well because we know that those defining moments they, they happen throughout a contest so we've got to be able to reproduce and produce those power outputs under fatigue but for me that that's what we've got to be looking at as, as coaches is can our athletes produce power when it matters in those defining moments in the games and if we're not preparing them for that if we're not actually trying to produce uh, improve those numbers I should say and give that power output it, it put that power output into our programs we're not gonna we're doing a disservice now how we do that the strategies we take with that is open to some debate and and hopefully I can share a few of my thoughts with you this evening on that so why power well it's the defining moments of sporting contests that are defined that, that are characterized by explosive efforts and that's what we're going to be preparing for in our training programs so types of power so I'm going to go through the different types of power now so essentially the, I've picked out pictures that, that characterize these types of power and the first type of power is what's called speed power essentially it's speed and in terms of exercise selection we're looking at things that are no weight or light loads up to about 20% 1 RM so speed power is things like plyometrics it's it's sprinting it's it's obviously in this case it's hurdles but it's sprinting it's agility work it's very light loaded implements and that's the first type of power to prepare for or to consider in your programs where does it come in your sport and are you training for it in uh, your program are you preparing for it and before I get into this before I and just to really make sure I don't forget when we're going through these types of power and program design ultimately our programs need to be complementary for the sport and the training holistic training that's going on around our sessions generally speaking as S&C coaches we don't have full control we don't just have people that train with us they do their technical work they might do other type of, of conditioning outside of what we have in, in access to so holistically we need to make sure that what we're doing is complementary so if you've got this guy in front of you now this this sprinter well if, if his technical training and his preparation involves a lot of sprinting and speed power work in that 0 to 20 percent range well the complementary training that we might do with him might not have much of that if any it might be that we work in different developing different types of power and we work in a complementary fashion and timing plays a, a big factor here as well it might be that certain times of the year this guy's doing a lot of sprinting and a lot of hurdle work and a lot of plyometrics so in our sessions we might not do a lot of that and that in the off season it might be that we need to go back to doing some basic plyos and, and, and kind of get him sprinting a little bit just to keep some of that stuff going for him but we've got to make sure that it's complementary otherwise we're over uh, potentially overdoing certain, certain of these aspects and it's all holistically based and intrinsically linked so here's the second type of power I picked out this picture of Jess Ennis. Uh, now you can argue that the the javelin is a light loaded implement. It probably falls around that 20% mark or so. But the second type of power is ballistic power. And that's using things that are around about 20 to 40% 1 RM. And we're looking at things like light loaded jump squats, uh, things like trap bar jumps or even light snatches would fall into this category anything that's got around about that 20 to 40 percent 1 RM type loading on it falls into the ballistic power category and possibly tennis would fall into that as well when you the sporting the environment that we're in it would probably be speed power or ballistic power this re represents max power so what I'm looking at here is the contact and the, the fact that you got a guy driving into another body 
and depending on how strong and how and some of the the biomechanics of that that contact is is really where we want that max power to occur so when it comes to getting people strong and and the the objectives that we've got as coaches if we are, are training athletes in a, a combat sport or a contact sport uh, so you take an MMA fighter for example I know that my guys are going to be stepping into the cage at whatever weight it is so let's take Scott Askham on the 20th of June he fights in Berlin for the UFC so Scott's going to be getting back into that cage at around about 90k middleweight on Saturday night so my goal for him is to make him maximally powerful with his opponent so his opponent's going to be around about 90k as well so I need so I know that Scott needs to be able to drive maximally into his opponent and psychologically that's a massive bonus for him so if, if we know that max power occurs around about that 40 to 60 percent 1RM which depending on your training background and, and whatnot but for, for well trained or uh, com combat contact sport type people there's a strong chance that it will knowing that we can say well actually we need to we need him to be able to squat or deadlift or or drive twice his body weight which means that his body weight i.e. his opponent is in that 50 percent max power zone and that's a great psychology for him to have going into that fight so we do things like opponent on the bar cleans we do heavy sled pushes we do max power efforts with opponent's body weight and and training to get really powerful and explosive around that max power zone so that's that's representative of, of the max power uh, 40 to 60 percent zone then we move up a little bit and we get into um, this explosive power zone sorry that's supposed to be 80 uh, 60 to 80 uh, percent explosive power so in this context maybe Maybe that's going a little bit higher, but this guy is so strong that he's cleaning this weight. Uh, he's probably going to be around about that in that zone somewhere. But explosive power zone is is huge to develop, and it's something that quite often gets missed out that that zone of development there. And then the final, I guess, type of power here that we're talking about is the max strength zone, 80 to 100 percent 1RM. And obviously, the picture in front of you is a, is a max effort squat, and um, that's going to be closer to the 1RM. But when we're looking at programming, this is just a simple way of breaking down if you're ticking the boxes with your athletes, and, and also to analyze your own sport of where these things occur, and if you're then catering for them in your programs. It's not an exact science. But it's just something to have a look at to say, right, we need to do this, we need to do that, we need to have some plyos in there, what are we doing for max power, how are we developing explosive strength and, and what are we doing for max strength and just making sure that you're ticking all those boxes. Because our goal as coaches for me, first and foremost, is the development of general athleticism, which means that we can look at the, the athlete, athletic profile and say, how are we essentially improving in all areas before we need to then say right now we've got to get specific and go into what this sport needs or whatever that that athlete is needing right there and I'll get into that in a little bit as well oh this is a bonus one for you couldn't, couldn't do a power presentation without including fill the power in there now I don't know what type of power that falls that into depending on it might be power endurance it might be uh, speed power but but it's a uh, it's it's a cool photo anyway fill the power there and um, so we've got our, th our five types of power so we've got speed power and we've got ballistic power max power explosive power and maximal strength and then just this table here just really kind of summarizes that and brings it all together and this is something that Dan Baker's load power spectrum Dan Baker presented this and at our workshop and this is one of his examples of how he puts this together and I wanted to share this with you today. So essentially stage one is our introduction to power training 
and really that's about learning to move well but from a plyometric perspective we're looking at hop and holds and we're looking at stability essentially before we move into actually producing power then we're moving into a speed power kind of block of training where we're going to be doing lower intensity plyometrics and ballistic movements starting to come in but mostly just body weight stuff and repetitive continuous work then we're going to go into more ballistic power so increased essentially increasing the resistance when we've when we've learned to to handle those movement patterns in the speed power block so getting up to barbell jump squats bench throws that kind of thing then we move into a, a proper power training phase or, or, or block and we can increase the loads even further start introducing basic derivatives of Olympic lifts etc etc and then we get to our more advanced work which is explosive strength training uh, so we're using power based loads we might do depending on the the training age and the background we might use some resistance bands we might use some chains and essentially taking the the power training stage four exercises but adding a little bit more complexity to them with the use of those bands and chains and depending on philosophy depending on who you who you're working with we've got an Olympic weightlifting progression in there as well where we're going to use the fantastic tools of cleans and snatches and their derivatives to build and, and essentially you can work all of those uh, sides or, or parts of the types of the power power curve that we've, we've talked about as well so that's a summary of development and it's specific to actual power side the, the explosive strength and power development not necessarily the the strength side of things that's a, a separate one but when it comes to power that's the sort of progression that we're looking to go through over a period of months and years with with athletes so I hope that makes sense and obviously Dan Baker has done some great work on that as well so now we come to surfing for power and um, just want to let you just think about kind of that wave in front of you and the, the angle and the curve that we're looking at there and uh, really this is what, what programming is all about and the types of power we've looked at from 0% up to 100% fit nicely onto this curve that's in front of you now, this force velocity curve. Now I know this is going to be really basic stuff for some of you out there, but um, I just wanted to take the time to go through it anyway because it's essentially a fundamental concept for, for strength and conditioning coaches to be familiar with. Um, so force velocity curve right in front of you. So very intuitively, very obviously, the heavier the load at the top here, the slower it's going to move. Think of your max effort deadlifts. Doesn't move very fast. Likewise, lighter the load, the faster it's going to move. Think of sprinting, med ball throws, plyometrics, that kind of thing. And mention this, this overall goal of developing general athleticism and so our real goal here is to move that entire curve to the right all the way down so that we can move heavier loads quicker and we can move lighter loads quicker and everything in the middle as well so here comes an argument where we have bias in our programs because if we do light loads all the time so we, don't, we have a program that's heavily biased towards plyometrics, to sprints, to not lifting any heavy stuff very often, then we do develop this curve and we move it a little bit at the bottom end. But we don't develop that, or create that rounded athleticism that we're looking for. And uh, I know you guys have had to type some questions in. Please do keep typing them in. I'll probably pick them up if, at the end of the talk if that's okay. And likewise, if we just train with heavy or maximal loads, we develop the top end of the curve. So we, we do develop the ability to, to move those loads quicker, but it doesn't really improve things at the bottom end or even the middle of the curve. So what's the answer? Well, here, 
here's the here's the answer. It's a combination of all of those things. So we need to train with heavy loads. We need to train with light loads. We need to train with medium loads, and we need to essentially tick all the boxes. And this is what's called surfing the curve to develop that rounded athleticism. How we decide which ones to use and how we prioritize depends on a number of factors. Things like the training age and background of, of your athlete is, is critical with this. We're not going to worry too much about uh, doing ticking all the boxes of the you know speed power curve when we've got people that can't even move properly. So let's just get them moving well, let's get some strength in there, and then that's, let's add some of those specifics later. On the flip side to that, when we've got more advanced athletes preparing for specific contests, we've got to have a look at which areas are most relevant to that sport. So clearly, a sprinter or a hurdler you could argue they don't need to do a lot at the top end of that, but we also, i.e., the heavier loads. But we also know that strength plays a massive part when it comes to producing force explosively, and um, so we've got to we've got to have the the heavier loads in there for them. Um, but but when you've got a, a sport like rugby or a sport like a combat sport where there is collisions and contacts in there, you've got to have a, a little bit of a look about what they're doing in their own training, if they're, if they're getting exposed to a lot of this stuff and, and the sport's taking care of an element of this and work around it. And so it might be that with your rugby players, they're doing quite a lot of work in the middle here, in that kind of 50 to 80% zone on the field. They're doing collisions, they're doing a lot of driving work. So we, we need to complement that by doing maybe lighter loads in training and exposing them to some of the 90% plus type loads in there as well. Uh, same with MMA, a sport that I've worked with for many, many years. They get a lot of exposure to this type of stuff in training, so the biggest impact, quite often, excuse the pun, is getting them super strong and then getting them super powerful down here with their own body weight. But that's not always the case, and we've got to look at the sport, we've got to say, what your opponents like, uh, the the elements of the game plan that are gonna that, that need to be accommodated for. Is your opponent gonna come at you with a lot of wrestling based stuff, or are you gonna be on your feet? And and we've got to look at and design the the S and C program around that accordingly. So that's your surfing elements, guys. And this uh, this graph is a very well known one that's taken out of. It's been in a lot of journals and books and stuff, but essentially just summarizes it nicely for you. And we've got the, the speed power into your plyos, moving into your medium loads, your snatches and your cleans, and then into your 80-90% plus loads and, and obviously your maximum strength at the top there. Real simple, real real basic stuff. But if you're if you have a natural bias, if you run a gym that most of the guys do heavy maximal strength work. It's worth thinking about: Are you doing enough down at this end here to get that true transfer of training, to get that rounded athleticism across to your athletes? And in terms of power development, we'll go back to the force velocity curve. We can see that if we're trying to develop power, if we have that holistic goal to develop more power, well, it's not going to occur at maximal strength type loads and and it's not going to occur with hardly anything on there as well. You need to have something to train against to produce that power and this curve shows that nicely. It's going to be somewhere in the middle there, it goes back to our 40 to 60 percent max power zone. That's where we're actually going to build power. Now it is obviously different for different lifts and I'm not going to go into what loads are going to be relevant, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, for different exercises because it's so dependent on again training background and sport and who you're working with, etc. But if you want to read more about that, this one's quite a nice paper. They said one of Prue Cormie and her research group, Optimal Loading, 
for max power during low body resistance exercise. It's quite a nice journal article, gives you some really good research and pretty definitive loadings for some of those exercises. So worth checking out guys if you're interested in that and you want to take that a little bit further. And a subject that I want to just touch on here to, to kind of take this a little bit further is, excuse me while I grab a drink of water, is power endurance. And one of my mentors, Kelvin Giles, talks a lot about this concept of, he, t he, t he calls it tough, suff and duff. We've got to develop technique under fatigue, skills under fatigue, and decision making under fatigue. And ultimately, power endurance is a, a critical component of that. You go back to those defining moments right at the beginning of this talk. Well, power endurance, we need to be able to produce power when we're tired. So when you think about the classic energy production chart in front of you here, which I'm not going to get into which, which systems are doing what. Ultimately, they all work at all times, but um, clearly... We know that our our work in those first few seconds is is without essentially without oxygen, and then we introduce more dependency on the aerobic system the longer the effort goes. So, when it comes to preparing, what are the bouts or flurries or, or specific power elements that that your athletes need to be prepared for? And very often, it's not necessarily one or two seconds, um, and they've got to have that ability to, to do it a little bit longer. Um, and, and so when it comes to power endurance for, for many sports, it's a really, really important facet for me. And um, we've got to build the quality before we learn to endure it. You've got to have some power and, and also have some strength in the first place before you even think really about starting to do power endurance work but closer to competitions for me this becomes a, a really big part of of the program and I want to just give you a few examples of, of how I look to target power endurance so the first one is really just simple it's a, it would I, we, I use a five by five protocol in this case a clean explosive strength exercise with limited rest. Now, five by five cleans, not necessarily thought of as power endurance, but when you say when you when you think that each one of those sets takes up to say thirty seconds or so, well you it is an endurance effort. It's not an outright power effort when you've done that third, fourth and fifth. So once you've built that quality and you might have been working on power cleans, for example, for you know, doing five sets of two or, or six, six or seven sets of two or three, bringing them into a five by five format with a limited rest period is a very, very demanding protocol from a power endurance perspective. And it's great for those athletes that, that need that, what I call that opponent on the bar type consideration. Your rugby players, your MMA fighters, guys that are lifting and dropping people guys that are wrestling and, and rolling with people, if they've got 90k on the bar, that's 5x5 five five with 120 seconds rest. That's a key milestone for me in our athletic preparation process and it really does mark that transition from working outright strength power work into more of our power endurance phases and if they can nail that 5x5 five five cleans two or three weeks on the, on the trot, and know that they're ready for more demanding power endurance work closer to the season or, or closer to the competition. The next one I want to talk about is what I call heavy, medium, light timed triceps. Firstly, why are they timed? Well, that's our measure. So we know that if they do that again faster or slower, they've not produced the same amount of power. And why heavy, medium, and light? because we need the quality to be there all the way through. If I do it medium, light, heavy, for example, they're doing the heavy right at the end when actually they need to be doing that at the start when, it's, when they're fresher 
and they've got a chance of nailing that. So an example here, just give you some context. I've got three that I use. So the first one is a total body tricep for power endurance. First exercise is body weight on the bar, power clean. So it's um, four reps. Second one, the medium load is a 33% body weight dumbbell snatch, four reps each arm. And the third one, the light one, is box jump. <clears throat> box jumps to somewhere between knee and hip height, closer to the hip. And we, we set them up around the platform so they've got easy access to it. We start the stopwatch. They go, they bang out four cleans. They do four snatches each arm with a dumbbell. And then they jump on the box. And it stops on the fourth jump onto the box. And then we stop the clock. Next man goes. And we do a nice, solid four or five to one work to rest ratio there. Three or four sets in a session. And it forms a big part of our power endurance training. For, I use this for many sports, but most in, most of the time, it's rugby and martial arts. Works really well, and again, it takes you. If you think about the cleans here, the five by five cleans taking sort of 30, 30 ish seconds. This is taking you into like 40, 50 seconds. So we're building it with our outright power work here. We're then learning to endure it, and then we're learning to endure it even more. The next one I want to talk about is complex or, or post-activation potentiation type training. And why is that power endurance, you might think? Well, the thing is, PAP training, essentially, for those of you not aware of it, is, is supersetting gen traditionally strength exercises with power exercises. So it might be, say, heavy squats with squat jumps. And more these days more more actually getting a lot more power supersetted with power exercises so you might do say a, an 80% exercise with a 40% exercise or even something around that kind of 50-60% zone and, and supersetting it with something around that 30-60% to 60 zone again and the idea behind that is to get a, an activation a post sorry a potentiation effect after the activation of the the prior exercise and most people tend to do this with the goal to, to develop power outright power and have a, an increase on that potentiation of power and what I found was that having researched and, and, and I did my master's thesis on, on post activation potentiation but uh, having applied this it's absolutely, it's very difficult, not impossible, very difficult to manage a group based on optimizing and potentiating each individual. And something that really quickly for me just became impractical. And now what I tend to do with it is I'd use them more as a, a strength, a power endurance protocol. And so I'm not that bothered, therefore about the outright power and therefore getting the the um, the rest period right etc etc what I want is the intent to move things as fast as possible for the duration of that set so we use a lot of trap bar jumps supersetted with either something specific to the sport like a, a tackle bag hit or we'll do it with vertical jumps on the jump mat to get that carryover. But essentially what you're getting is a longer set of power efforts, i.e. power endurance. And they're learning to endure and produce power under fatigue. So have a think about that when you're designing your power, uh, your post activation potentiation complexes. What are you actually getting from that? And, if, and the way it works well for me is that when you click into thinking, actually, we need power endurance, so I'm going to use my PAP stuff for power endurance, it does click into place a little bit easier from a, a mental perspective as a coach to say, well, we're getting power, but we're also getting power endurance, so I'm therefore not quite as bothered about the outright peak power that we're producing 
I'm more concerned with their intent to produce power over a slightly longer period of time. So PAP stuff for me tends to fall into the power endurance components of our program. The fourth com uh, consideration here, I've called it sports specific supersets. So going back to the heavy, medium, light time trisets, there's a reason that I do them that way. As I said to you, it's about quality and preserving the movement pattern. Well, closer to the season or closer to the competition, we've got to be thinking sport specific. We've got to be thinking what does that sport need? So essentially, this is a way that you can break the rules for this heavy, medium and light and think about what do we need? Are we going from an explosive impact, say like a, a drop jump, into into something like a squat and then into something like a explosive power press up and what we tend to do with these is look at what's going on in the sport and then put two or three and a maximum of maybe four exercises together to replicate some of these considerations that are going on and generally speaking I still try to stick with a heavy medium light but sometimes I mix it up so it might be that we do some drop jumps into some hurdle jumps as, as your light to start things off which is like your explosive powerful footwork then we might go into some trap bar jumps with 80 percent in there or a power max power type load where they're getting some real speed power type work in there and then we might finish up with something that replicates another component i.e. explosive press ups or some kind of sprint or some kind of treadmill treadmill kind of we, we, we turn the treadmills off and we just we just get them driving the, the belt on the treadmill with no with the, with the resistance there and just finish like that so it's a license to think about what's going on and, and put two to four exercises together that tend to be power based exercises that just give somebody a, a specific a specific um, training effect that's relevant to that sport. So that's another power endurance uh, technique or strategy that you can use there. And you've got to look at the time frames and what's relevant for the sport. You've got to look at have they built the qualities first, otherwise it just all turns into metabolic conditioning, which is not what we want. And you've got to look at that competence and the quality that's going on. And, and that's where you do need to properly think and design this stuff. And the last component, I've called it RSA, repeated sprint ability work. Now, RSA work is not usually deemed power endurance, but essentially it is. It's, it's speed and power endurance, and, and it, it, it's overlapping into some of the longer, more aerobic, continuous efforts. But it, it bridges that gap where we're going from heavy strength and power work here into slightly longer efforts here, into some of our heavy, medium, tight, light, time triceps and our complex training we're looking at then getting closer to the contest and looking at sports specific supersets and then here we might be doing four or five minutes of, of sprint based power work to take us towards our sport specific time frames that we're looking to replicate so I tend to stick to five minutes blocks here and it would literally be 15 seconds on, 45 seconds off to start with, but just replicating power for five minutes continuously and then closing that down. So we're going 2040s, 25, 35s, etc. etc. And the maximum we'll tend to get to is around about 35 on, 25 off. And um, that's your repeated sprint work. Doesn't have to be sprints, by the way. You can use any of these intervals that, that are relevant to the sport here. But um, but essentially plays a big part of my power endurance training program those the RSA work as we call it so there's just five real quick examples for you that I wanted to share today hope that makes sense but please do fire any questions over at that one you know I'm more than happy to to chat through anything and we mentioned specific power and this is a, a slide that you may have seen before in one of my other presentations or it's actually a UK athletics slide so you might have seen it through some of their presentations and um, 
I'm not going to spend too long on it, but long story short, the closer to the event, the more specific the exercises are that traditionally we choose. So the further out of the event, the more athlete specific they are. So we'll look at developing rounded athleticism out here, we're further out we are from the event, and the closer to the event we're looking at sport specific power based or, or general exercises. So that's where your, your sport specific triceps for power endurance come into play uh, for, for the specificity here. And um, I want to kind of touch briefly on this strength or power conundrum. And this is a good paper. I couldn't. I do. I'm sure I had the journal on my computer somewhere, but I couldn't find it. So, long story short, this is it. This is the paper, and it's a, another Prue Cormie, Jeff McBride paper. And really, what what they examined or what they found in this was that the less experienced you are as a resistance training or gym-based trainee the less that specific power train the less effect specific power training has on your development the less you're going to get out of it so the more advanced you are the more you're going to get out of using specific power based work in your programs so in other words you don't really need to think about doing advanced power training strategies with chains and bands and some of those triceps and things like that when you're just trying to teach someone how to do a basic squat, it's not going to have the same carryover. And it goes into the context that we have to build strength first before we develop power. We have to build power first before we develop power endurance or strength endurance. You can't endure a quality that you don't have. So when we talk about power training, as I've done today, a lot of this stuff is not necessarily relevant for people who have very little training background. And then we go back to our long-term athlete development model that I showed you early on, and that phase one power, and we're literally just teaching somebody how to hold a, a squat landing, a squat jump landing. We're literally teaching somebody how to hop and hold and land on one leg and, and stabilize. We're teaching people how to do uh, a press-up with good form, and, and then they can actually add some load, some speed to that. So it's common sense, but we still see a lot of people that have absolutely no real right doing structured power training doing it. They're still doing that stuff that you think, actually, you're not even strong enough to, th to even think about doing that yet. So get people strong first and then think about incorporating more advanced power exercises. But at the same time as building strength, we can be going through phase one and two power work with them, which is, as I say, hop and hold, stability-based focus, low-intensity reactive jumps, and continuous kind of vertical jumps and things like that, and keeping it really simple. And your strength athletic development program moves slightly ahead of your power athletic development program. So you're always one step ahead with your strength than you are with your power, because they're then earning the right to produce that power. And Dan Baker made a great comment to me on the over Skype one day. I think he was talking about power training, and so we did a webinar. And some of you might even have been on this webinar. It was years ago. And Dan, somebody asked a question to Dan about power training for the academy at the Brisbane Broncos, which is where Dan was head of S and C at the time. And he said because Dan had presented a great in amount of information on bands and chains and and somebody asked that question do you use bands and chains with the academy and Dan's answer was great it was super simple he said don't give away your good stuff too early and when you think about that it makes so much sense don't give away your good stuff too early you've got to go through that athletic development process through stages one two three and four before you get to five and six so don't get jump into giving people bands and chains just because they're sexy and you think they might enjoy it. There is a balance to be had there, and actually they need to demonstrate competence and get the training effect from that other stuff. 
Because if you jump to bands and chains before ready for it, they don't get the training effect when they are ready for it to the same degree. So we, we kind of ruin it. We sab sabotage our athletes' development for ourselves, for our need to kind of give them the good stuff too early. So get people strong first, especially when they've not had any experience in the gym. Um, if they're coming back from an injury or they've got a good training background, then there's a balance to be had. But ultimately, we've got to get people strong before we start to build power, and especially power endurance as well. So a couple of examples here. Uh, this is um, Danny Haig, one of my colleagues, put these sessions together. We did a, a course for um, power training, strength training a couple of years ago, and, and Danny worked with me at university, and now he's full-time doing his own thing, and he's, he's a great S&T coach. And Danny's got a similar philosophy to me, and I, and I think the way he's put these programs together is absolutely bang on. So really, it doesn't have to be complicated. This is a power training session for one of our rugby league players, uh, not a, a massive background in the gym from an S&T perspective. And all we're doing is a couple of supersets um, of power work and then moving it on a little bit. So we're doing a, a hand clean, power clean, supersetting it with a split jerk. We're getting some of that almost potentiation work in there, but just kind of crossing things over there and, and, and good contrasting movement. We're doing some supersets where we're doing a heavier exercise but power based work with a jump squat so we're going like a 55% into a 35% we're doing some reasonably light floor presses into some bench throws to get that potentiation again and obviously finishing with a little bit of conditioning on the trunk in there so real super simple and that's how we put those supersets together where you're working 30, 55 and 30% 55-35% and obviously some explosive strength work at the start of the session and progressing it from there. Here's a boxing program. So again, in this case we've got a superset, a tricep, and a little bit of uh, conditioning. So hang snatch, supersetted with some um, body weight, essentially body weight plyos in there. So we're getting a, a kind of a medium load into a body weight plyo type movement. We're getting some some chins there, which are very very simple for the for our boxers because they're pretty strong. Supercent it with some jerks, and notice that we're going we're going from a a pulling movement to a pressing movement, and the pulling movement is the potentiating movement, and the pressing movement is the power movement. And we see there's a little bit of research to support that. And um, it, it, it works. We, we've tried it in a few different ways, but works really well. And um, and then obviously finishing with some explosive landmine work as well, and a bit of clinch work. And last one. Not that we tend, not you get a lot of distance runners doing power work, but uh, we have a good go with ours. Just keeping it super simple again. We've got three tri sets in there and lightish, lightish loads all the way through, some jump squats, some kneeling throws and some uh, face pulls in there, some trap bar deadlifts for strength, obviously higher reps for a, a beginner, with some chin ups and some get ups and then we're finishing with a bit of single leg work and some pulling, so basic athletic development program, not really graduated to doing a lot of power work in there, just a couple of exercises right at the start of the session to get that get that little bit of transfer. Always try to do a little bit of power work at the start, whether it's preparation stage one, two power, or whether it's actually advanced power, depend, irrespective of the time of the, the season. Um, you, you're going to have multiple physical qualities that need training with most athletes anyway. So it's good to have your power in there, irrespective. So, just a little bit of a summary now. And... Um, Number one, very clearly, power is critical to sports performance. So we've got to train it. We've got to make it happen in our programs. We've got to facilitate it and have a plan in place to deal with it. The type of power is also critical 
what does your sport need? Where is the athlete at in terms of their development? Close the gap. What strategies are you going to use? If in doubt, surf the curve. So tick all of those boxes. Make sure that some speed work in there, there's some medium loads, there's some medium heavy loads and then there's some heavy stuff in there. And from an off-season perspective, a general athletic development perspective, surf the curve. Tick those boxes. As I said, strength comes before power. Build it and then learn to endure it. Strength then power, power then power endurance, etc, etc. And I think what I wanted to try and get across to you with the case studies is that it's really simple. It's a couple of exercises in there at the start of a session. When you're really hammering pure power, so you might have, say, if you've got a twice a week in-season program, you might have a strength day and a power day, for example. So on your power day, you might look at something like that intermediate rugby league program where they've got three, three pairs of power-based exercises in that program. You're going to get some power off the back of that. So it's ultimately keeping it super simple, looking at what their competence is, keeping the strength development one step ahead of the power development so that they always earn the right to progress to those more complicated exercises. And um, I'm just going to have a look at any questions that have come up here, just to, um, just to have a read through. Um, yeah, no problem, Steve. Thanks for that. Can't believe that was free. Thanks very much, Brendan. Really enjoyed it. That's cool. Um, let me have a look here. Sorry to keep you waiting. Dave Riedel, don't forget the psychology, most important bit. <laughs> you know what, Dave? The more I coach people, and, and you, I'm sure you'll agree, the more I absolutely agree with you. And um, interestingly enough, in my own personal development as a coach, I think strength and conditioning coaches tend to go through cycles. And when I first started coaching, I was fascinated with strength training and, and getting people super strong. And um, then I then I got absolutely obsessed for some reason with sort of corrective exercise work and functional anatomy, and and spent a couple of years really studying that. Did some therapy work and everything like that in there. And then I got really obsessed with power training. As I said, did my master's research on PAP and very, very into it, knew every single paper out there. And, and I still have a very strong interest in power training. And then I moved completely away from the corrective exercise uh, because I realized that the environments that I was working in, people just want results. And not that I'm against it or anything like that, but I think that good coaching is corrective exercise in itself. So it, it's all about keeping that minimal dose of, of exercise to get a response in there for me. And, and that's kind of where my, my S&C coaching is right now. But what I've, what I've become much more focused on in the last three or four years is actually my coaching and my communication skills and therefore getting buy-in and getting results from your athletes based on that. And I think if you can create a good culture where you've got good psychology, where people want to tear it up and lift heavy, lift fast, lift, lift smart, that's where you, you do get long-term results. And it's not about how fancy your program sheet looks. It's about how well you communicate and relate to these people and how well you psychologically prepare them for their activities as well. And that's where good experts like Dave and, and the rest of the crew at the Chimp Squad and, and all, all the other good psychologists out there come into play, but essentially it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's tuning into to what people really need and what they feel like they want and, and bridging the gap and giving them a solution that really does engage them. I mentioned it in my last webinar, it engages them and it excites them to, to actually start tearing things up and getting results, you know. Um, Callum is asked, what kind of rep ranges, rest periods would you use for the five types of power? Well, I mean, the five types of power you pretty much essentially use the same. You want as close as to full recovery as you can. Now that's not always feasible when it comes to working in a, a group or a squad together, but um, you want close to full recovery there because obviously you want those fibers ready to fire maximally so you get max intent 
and therefore match results out of it. When you move into power endurance, it's a different game altogether, but close to full recovery as you can. Now, for me, I'd always sacrifice that kind of full recovery to, to get a little bit more density and, and keep a focus on work capacity in there because gym readiness and gym fitness or preparedness, if you want to call it that, is, is critical for me and, and you've got to keep building your work capacity. So I'd take a, a 98 or 95 percent recovery over 100 if it meant the difference between resting for three minutes versus 33 minutes or 10 minutes. And some of our athletics guys, they'll sit at the back of the gym with their iPad for 15 minutes before they go for another set of squats. Well, that quickly stopped when I, I got my hands on them. And it was like, you know, get back in there. You've had, you've had five minutes or whatever. So five, three to five minutes is not that long a time to, to recover, especially if you're putting something else in the middle, like if you're doing a lower body to an upper body exercise. So get yourself a, a, a timer in there because... If you've got athletes that like to take advantage of that full recovery side of things that we talk about, then get yourself a timer so they can. And it's a poor excuse that they need more time. You know, just get in there and, and train. It, it really is a poor excuse. Just get fitter for producing these loads uh, more consistently. How much... Rest between strength exercise and ballistic exercise for fatigue to dissipate and potentiation to occur, Steve Legg. That is the million dollar question. Well, maybe not a million, but it's certainly worth something. And um, the truth is, it depends. It depends on how heavy the strength exercise is and how heavy the ballistic is. It depends on how well trained the athlete is and how fit they are, as you said, to tolerate that type of load. I would use real common sense with it. If you've just asked someone to do a three rep max at 92% and they've ground that third rep out and then you ask them to jump on a box five times, you are not getting any potentiation there. You're just getting fatigue, right? That's absolute common sense. So that's why we've moved away from doing real strength exercises for complex training and moved more into power exercises because it's quicker to recover from a power exercise. So you're better off doing a trap bar dead, a trap bar jump at 70% for five reps and getting some real explosiveness. Then you can shake off and, and take a minute or so to recover before you do some vertical jumps on the jump mat or you do some sprints or you do some specific work like hitting a tackle bag or something like that. So if you're asking someone to perform at 90%, a genuine 90% and then do, do a power exercise straight afterwards, what you're going to get is fatigue. If you're asking someone to do a power and then a power, you'll get a much better carryover to actual potentiation or performance. I hope, I hope that makes sense, Steve. Yeah, good stuff, Ross. Just telling me about his master's thesis. Ross did it the opposite way. Ten power strokes from rowing, increased activation effect in a three rep max leg press. Can totally see that, yeah, it does, and that's the the interesting thing with post activation potentiation. The more people are doing it, you, you know, really, quite a lot of things can be used for an activation potential, and um, it's therefore our creativity and looking at the sport that we can use that and use the kind of the intuition or the the instinct that that's going to work and take it into a sport specific prep. A question from Scott, usually uh, currently the owner of a gym and a young gym and they've implemented a strength program, a 5-3-1 program to give the clients a solid base of strength before we move on to some power training. My question is how long do you recommend we maintain strength before getting onto power training cycle? Well I think I think you can introduce power work straight away so you know what you look, you can always do that, that sort of stage one basic power work, you can then move it into some box jumps and you know you, you can judge that as a coach, the competence of people. If you start doing more advanced or not advanced the wrong word, if you start doing more structured power training work where the objective of that phase is to produce more power, then I think the biggest thing there is they need to it is fatiguing, it is mentally fatiguing, they need to have really decent technique to produce to move those loads fast 
and they need to understand what they're doing and the educational element of why they're doing it. Otherwise, it just tends to get lost. It's it's a bit easier when you've got a heavy weight on a bar. Just say lift that thing, get it up, and they and they will or they won't. In power, it's like move that thing fast, and it's actually very different game when it comes to the the emotions and the psychology that goes with power training. So I think that's where, as a coach, you've got to look at them and say, are they ready for this? Do they really understand it? And you can probably gauge that by introducing two or three exercises at the start of their power uh, their strength training sessions and see how they take to those and see if they're doing it with maximal intent and if they and if you then get the feeling that they are you can introduce some more and then you can say actually we've got a good base of strength now uh, let's get into doing our our power training sessions we're going to do you know one session a week or whatever it may be but usually you need a bit of an output a goal sorry an outcome sorry a goal to work towards with power training which which you decide it's good if you can measure something at the start, measure like broad jumps, measure their power clean, measure their snatch, but also measure, if you can anyway, measure um, how fast they move things. So you, you don't have to have any fancy equipment. You can do timed sets like we do five reps in five seconds. So what? how much strength, what can you, what, what weight can you put on the bar but still maintain the the five second load, the five second time, and you can gradually increase that. Or you can say we're gonna do um, we're gonna do fifty percent of your body weight and you're gonna do five reps and time that. So give them an output, give them a testing battery that ticks that something heavy, something medium, something light, maybe one or two of each, so that they actually get something to work towards, get some feedback in the training. And you'll guaranteed you'll get massively better results on that spot if you do it like that, rather than just saying, "Right, we're going to do some power." Dave, read. Dave's asked that how how would you improve power in sprint cyclists? Um, so I think there's got to be a lot of specific stuff in there, and obviously. I know you got a great background in, in sprint cycling yourself, so I, I like I'm quite a get out of the gym and do specific work there. You know, I, I like messing around with the different gears. Uh, as you know, I work with a few cyclists, so messing around with different gears, I really do believe that, that that's going to have a, a transfer. So heavier gears, lighter gears, contrast phases where you go from a heavy into a light. Um, so I do like that. I like the build it and then endure it mantra with that as well. So getting super powerful over shorter distances and then lengthening those distances out to, towards your race distances. Uh, obviously gym based, I think a lot of sled work, a lot of single leg work in there as well as your bilateral work will, will really improve it from a strength perspective. But then I think some of the ballistic strength stuff and some of those timed sets, because for me cycling is a lot about fluency and um, not just out and out kind of sort of strength strength power or strength speed. So you can if you can introduce some continuous fluency type, you know, even eight to ten reps where you're timing it with with loads on there to try and keep that speed up. It's really fatiguing stuff, but uh, I think those work really well from a, a transfer perspective in the gym towards those kind of manipulating the gears outside. Uh, just some ideas. Thanks, Lucas. Very informative. I'm going to give some cool prizes away at the end, guys, for people who are still on the line. Um, so stick around. I'm going to answer a couple more questions at the end. And um, I'm going to take a few seconds to just talk you through our mentorship, if you don't mind. We've got a, a lot of this stuff that was shared today is on the mentorship and and and, and more. Um, so what we, we're getting on the mentorship now is a, a really fantastic group of people that we've know, we've got about a hundred people on it. We're starting a new program on the 11th of May next Monday, and we've got quite a few people listening in who have signed up to that. And really, we look at these three pillars of development, which I call the 
the coaching pillar, your nuts and bolts, the stuff we talked about tonight, your personal development, which is why you're doing what you're doing, where you want to go with it, and then your business or career development, which is the how you're going to get there, specific strategies. I think personal development, talk about psychology, you know, a lot of the time we block ourselves, we have a lot of limiting beliefs. We need to do more of this. We need to get out our own way. We need to free ourselves up to actually achieve what we want. Why are you studying that gym? Or why do you want to be studying that gym? You know, what do you want out of it? And let's get some clarity on that. And those three pillars is really about giving you the tools. So today I gave you some tools on how to develop power, how to program for power. Well, we give you tools on all the elements of strength and conditioning, as well as your personal development and your business development. How do you get clients? How do you network into roles in performance sport? Do you ultimately have those tools? We've got 26 modules of content that we deliver, and we have a, a live event every three months where we bring everybody together and really kind of mix it up. Loads of different speakers, loads of different coaches. The commonality is that all the coaches are doing it. They are in the trenches. They are working with performance athletes or they're running their own gym or they're you know, a combination of both. And we do that every three months. You've got a personal mentor, somebody again who's done it who's, or doing it, that you speak to personally, confidentially every month or so. And we're, we're recruiting for May the 11th at the moment, which is actually only Monday. It's Monday, so literally get in the mix if, you, if you're interested. So we've got a three-day live event, and we hold that up at Yorkshire County Cricket. It's always in a, a good performance environment. And the last one was amazing. We had Ian Fisher doing a session on guaranteed speed, Dave Hember in there, Yusef Zhu talked about Olympic weightlifting, took me through the practical side, added some of my combat stuff. We had Danny Haig in there, we had Darren Stratton doing mobility, and um, we also had Ian Piper in doing it, who works with Alistair and Johnny Brownlee, doing a lot of metabolic work. Nick Ward from England Golf did some stuff as well. And we had, I think we had about 30 people that really just got stuck in for three days. It was absolutely awesome. And went out on the night. We, we really like a, what I call a total immersion program. It's awesome. It, it's really a powerful, powerful three days to get your coaching skills up to a, to a high level. And we back that up with our learning portal. So our learning portal is where we, we upload all of our videos. We, have a, we deliver our modules that I mentioned, the 26 modules over a period of nine months. And once we deliver them, you get to watch them whenever you want. So it's totally flexible. You can do it on a Sunday morning. You can do an hour a day. You can do a morning a week, whatever you want. And we give you access to that. You can also upload a program so you've got feedback from myself and, and the rest of our mentors so that you essentially get that expertise to say, hang on a second, think about just changing that or why have you, why have you got your power exercise there? Why have you done that superset? Just challenge you or, or even just say, you know what, you bang on. It's, it's really cool that, that just crack on and deliver it. You'll get results. You can show videos of your, your own training or your sessions with your athletes so we can give you feedback on that. And obviously we put like business advice and tips on getting clients and everything like that into this learning portal so that you're up and running, you're in the mix. It's a really powerful process to have access to that. And we back that up with our Facebook group as well. So we've got a really good community on the Facebook group and lots of people just sharing things and getting the mix. And you know, for you on the mentorship, if you're looking to develop as a coach, if you really want to get into strength and conditioning or you want to open up your own gym or you want to have a, a consultancy business or you want to have more of an online, pre whatever it may be, it's a really good place to, to have like-minded people around you who are doing the same they're all doing the same and they're all pushing and that pushes you and it's a private non-disclosure environment as well so you can say anything in there it's a really cool process so I put wow on it you know it's it's ridiculous how good that is and um, we've now got a lot of other resources that are not sort of specific to the mentorship program in our resource center so you've got all of our conference videos you've got all of our access to all of our workshops that we've done over the years with people like Tommy Yule uh, from British Weightlifting, people like Jared Deakin on the speed side, 
Duncan French on the agility and the movement side. That is absolutely awesome. We've got a, a two-day workshop with Dan Baker in that resource centre that you get access to, and it, and it sells. We sell it on our website, but where else can you get access to, to that kind of stuff? It's it's really cool. You come out at the end of it. We register you at the start, and you come out at the end of it with a level three qualification in coaching, strength and conditioning for sport through First for Sport qualifications. It's a great governing body. It's something that I really believe in that we're delivering a great quality. You can get insurance. You can approach schools and teams and institutions, and it's a, a recognised quality that will, that is a high level. It's it's the same as rugby or tennis or rowing. They all run their qualifications through First for Sport. It classes you as a senior coach, and it's a good one that you don't just get a piece of paper at the end of the course that says "Well done, you passed." You got to actually demonstrate a little bit of competence there. But we take you through that on the process. All the modules are geared towards it. Your sessions with your personal mentor are also geared towards it and towards your three pillars of development that we work on throughout this whole process. It's a really good qualification. I think the, the catalyst for this is actually that you do get a personal mentor. Now, when we start with you, we send you what's called a coach profile sheet. You give us some information about what you want to do. You assess yourself, where you feel like your strengths are, where your weaknesses are, what you want to improve on. It might be that you, you, you've got a really good understanding of S&C, but you don't have an idea how to get any athletes or clients, or you want to get a, a new job in S&C. You might have a great business, but you want to move into getting people who are more athletic and more sporty. You might just want to improve your own knowledge and become a great, great coach with our network and our process. What we do is we match you up with a personal mentor that will help you. So we've got a great team of mentors. All of them are involved in sport. Obviously, everybody I, you've got access to me throughout this, but you'll have your own personal mentor as well. We've got Lawrence Bloom at Charlton Football Club, Ryan Blake at Surrey County Cricket, and Ian Fisher at Yorkshire County Cricket. We've got Nick Ward at in England Golf and uh, in the Rugby League. We've got Dave Hembry who works with GB Volleyball and Sheffield Hallam in the university environment. We've got um, Ian Piper, Alistair and Johnny Brownlee's coach, as well as multiple Olympics with GB Boxing. Fantastic mentors to have on the team. We've got Danny Haig, who looks after a lot of people who are looking to get into combat sports and uh, combat SNC and collision sports. He's fantastic at that. Talked about Danny tonight. We've got new mentors coming in that are super high level. So we've got Jared Deacon, who is one of the directors of the UKCA, joining us to mentor some people on our mentorship and obviously add value in our in our community and on our mentorship. We've got Stuart Yule, who last year won High Performance Coach of the Year for UKCA. He's the head of S&C at Glasgow Warriors. He's going to be mentoring people in rugby and in general. We've got Duncan French, who was chairman of the UKCA for five years. He's going to join and help with our mentorship program. Uh, it's fantastic to get Duncan in. He's a personal friend, as Jared is, but but it's just awesome to have him in there. He's my go-to guy for, for the research side, and he's just a great, great practitioner as well. We've got Dean Fuash. He was actually on the mentorship as a, a student, and now he's coming back in as a mentor. Dean won the young uh, Youth Coach of the Year, so he's worked with young athletes and young people for the UKCA, winning the award. And he's also got a, a very, very good personal training S&C business in, in Wales. Dean's going to be doing some mentoring on our program. It's fantastic to have Dean involved. So we're a really, really powerful group of mentors. And also, I want to give a shout out to the rest of our students on this course, people who are listening in, that are just great people, you know, people that are doing great things and, and moving forward. On the mentorship with your mentor, you work on those three pillars. We get you the clarity of where you're going. We give you the how to get there, and we obviously give you the skills and the tools to improve as coaches as well. And it's about action. It's about accountability and taking action. People who do well on this mentorship are people who really want to move forward fast in this next nine months. And you're never out of this process, by the way. You know, we've got people who are in our group five years after working with me back in the day when I was doing it. You know, for kind of. I didn't have anything structured going on, and I was just helping people and mentoring them. And now they're 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 adding value and they're back in the group. 
there's no reason why if you join us on this mentorship in a, in a year, two years, three years, how you, with, with your building and in your context, you can be on our mentor team because this program is growing massively. We've had a, 150 applications in the last month to join it. It's awesome. Um, but, but we're very, very stringent on who we work with because it's got to be people who are really keen to improve and, and that are going to add value as well, just, just good people, you know. Um, so for, for me, I, I genuinely do think it's the best development opportunity out there. There's nothing out there that, that helps you, that wraps you up, but also pushes you and challenges you as much as this process. There's nothing out there that's as thorough, that's putting you around the best practitioners, but also helping you to set up your own business or consultancy or whatever it may be that your goal is on the side. It's an absolutely awesome process. This is just one of our students who joined us this year in January. And um, it's, a, it's a really nice post that she put out on, on Facebook. And if you have a read of it, the thing is that with Natalie is that she's taken to it, she's attacked it, and she's out in Mallorca. She's not even in the UK. She's, she's out there in Europe. Uh, when we put this post out, or when she put this post out, I should say we had 12 spaces. We've now only got five left. Um, so we, 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 we start on Monday and it's going to fill up. But she's done amazingly, you know, it's really cool. And the, th the, the, the ideas that she, or the, the thoughts she's got on the support you get from the, the group and the mentors, everybody working together, it's a, it's a real, real catalyst in, in people's development. Here's another guy, Joe's just doing so well with his basketball guys and he's a, he's a successful PT and he's got a great boot camp in Cambridge. But Joe has really embraced the S&C. One of the things he made a, a comment about when he came back from the three-day course was how he, 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 sees, he sees things differently. He's thinking like an S&C coach, not a PT. And he's now using some of the protocols that Danny and I have, have shared and uh, on, on some of the stuff that I've showed you tonight. But massive improvements in his athletes' times. Great to see that. Here's another one with my ugly mug on it um, to, from Mel. Again, Mel's a great example of how to do really well in this course. She's attacked it. She's, she's got goals and she's moved from working a, more of a boot camp environment to having GB athletes. And today she just, te she just made a comment in the group saying she's been invited to, to, to go into a rugby league squad and start working with those guys. And um, the passion that she's got has been fueled through this course. And I think the comments she made, this is not just another course. This is a, a get things done development program where you see yourself raise the bar on your own development. That's what it is. That is genuinely what it is. Um, so, you know, if, you, if you're kind of on the fence and thinking, I need that push, well, this is, what you, this is where you're going to get it. I guarantee it. Um, Sam Guy was one of our. He was our student of the month last month, and I, he might even be listening in. I think his business partner Rob. I noticed Rob was on the line earlier. He's done. The two of them have done fantastically. He's um, just smashing it down in Cornwall. They run Cornwall High Performance. They've linked up with the uh, the surfing guys down there. They've got the University of Truro. They've got all sorts of different contracts coming in and. They're taking over down there. You know, it's it's an awesome process to just watch Sam and and Rob just really smashing it down there. So really cool testimonials from some of our people. Um, Danny Missins just joining us this year, this uh, this time round in in, uh, in May, and Simon Gow is one of our students at the moment. And it's again great to see Simon making these comments. Standards amazing, obviously. It's really nice to hear. He's learned so much, but, but Simon has developed a fantastic business as well off the back of this. And he's just working now with Wrexham FC. In, he's based in North Wales. His private practice is thriving. And when I see Simon, he's just glowing now because he's, he's smashing it. He's absolutely loving it. So I think, again, if that's your goal to kind of – Simon was more of a therapy, personal training type, type background – to really add S and C to your repertoire and, and, and smash it with, with S and C and our and our mentors and our business stuff, it really will take you forward. And obviously you've just seen just a few. I, I wanted to collect a few to show you. 
this evening, just a few examples there. And essentially, the value of the program is pretty cool because we've got our 26 modules and our learning portal, the three-day live event, the resource center, obviously your personal mentor that you get to work with, and your qualification. There's a lot of value there. There's a serious amount of investment that you could go, you could put into all of these things. But essentially, we, we've managed to kind of condense it. And when I first started, when I put this mentorship, uh, this webinar out, we were offering the first 15 places at that price, 2,400 plus VAT. Well, I've decided to to keep that price because I just wanted to get that congruence and that continuity but we literally now have five places left and we start on Monday we have five places left and we start on Monday so we need to hear from you really we need we need you to, to, to fill in our application form tonight if this is going to work for you and, and then what we do off the back of that is we give you a call we run through an application with you and obviously if we if we think it's the right course for you and if you think it's the right course for you as well then we get you registered on the phone and make sure that your place is secure uh, I know Darren's listening in I'm hoping that you can put the link in for the page where you can check it all out so Darren will type that in for you and what I've decided to do for this evening is to really just offer you a little bit of a, a bonus in a sense it's quite cool to do that. I mentioned it at the start. And anybody listening in, obviously if you've signed up, you know, we, that's no problem either. But anybody listening in, when you sign up, we're going to send you a link or a, actually a load of links to some of our best videos. Things like Core Training Considerations, a video that I did all about training the trunk and core. I did it on a live workshop. People paid quite a, quite a lot of money to attend it. Things like my Building MMA Athletes. Some stuff from Dan Baker, some stuff from Vern Gambetta and Kelvin Giles, two, two, uh, three of my biggest mentors right there. And it's worth over 500 quid. And we'll send you that when you sign up uh, tonight. When you, if you fill out your questionnaire tonight and the application form, and I'll tell you about that in a minute, as long as you filled it out tonight and we get you on the course in the next, by the end of tomorrow, um, We'll send you that this week, but I do need those forms through tonight. And I know Darren has literally just banged that link on the chat box: strengthandconditioningmentorship.com forward slash something main, I believe. Yeah, main. So just for this evening, you're going to get a bonus of 500 quid as well. That's what you're getting. Lots of my stuff, a load of other stuff as well, and uh, it's really, really cool. And I think the question for me that I'd ask you listening in is, is really how much do you want it? How much do you want to improve as a, as a practitioner, as a coach? Do you want it enough? And what does it mean to you to be nine months' time in a, 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 ra a radically different position to where you are right now? We've had people that have gone from opening up their own facilities in that nine months period and, and filling them with clients even less than nine months. We've got, got people that have gone from being a, a PT into a, a strength and conditioning coach working with athletes full-time. We've got people who've gone into full-time jobs with the English Institute of Sport and, and other environments, again, full-time as, as coaches. And really, we've, we've got people of all ranges, all ages, people who are have got no other formal qualifications as such, that have done really well because we've helped them and worked with them. We've got people who've got PhDs that have done really well. We've got people who are, are, are nearly 60 years old and people who are nearly 20 years old. So we've got a full range of people. And that's why it's so cool because everybody gets the same level of service. Everybody's in it to, to, to smash it for themselves and, and to help everybody else out. And that's what we, we really thrive on in this mentorship. So what does it mean to you to, to be in a radically different position or maybe flip that on its head and say, what would it mean to you to be in the same position as you are now in nine months' time? Why would you not move forward? And if you, if you, 
if you're going to do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always got, as they say. Ridiculous cliche, but it's cliche for a reason. It's true. If you don't change something, how would you even how would you even possibly develop to to where you want to go? So it's it's a cool process, and you know, as I say, you've seen what our people on the course have got to say about it. Um, it's a really fantastic process. So the link that Darren has put into that chat box for you will take you to a page where you can watch a video. Leanne's one of our one of our students at the moment, she's doing really well up in Scotland. We've got groups of people all over the country that are doing the program. Uh, Leanne's just one of them. And and there's a load of more testimonials on that page. You can watch the videos, you can get in the mix, you can read about all the modules, the three day course, how it works, your mentor, the applicate, everything like that, it's all there for you. Have a read through that. But what we need to make sure is we've only got 30 spaces, we've only got five left now, and that is completely and utterly genuine. Five left, no reason to, to, to bullshit you. It's genuine. We've, we've been absolutely inundated with applications, and it's fantastic. But I wanted to offer five more spaces tonight to, to, to close the program, and um, we're going to keep the 2,400 plus VAT rate for you for the process. And what we need to make sure is that you fill out this questionnaire form and that's if you go to strengthconditioningmentorship.com forward slash thank you and you need to complete that tonight and then we'll get in touch with you either tonight if you've got chance because you'll get that space sooner if you um, if you're able to to chat tonight and you can make that comment on the form or tomorrow and when you do that We'll get you signed up, provided it's right for you, and we think it's right for you as well. And you go through the application process, okay? Uh, we're looking for people who are really ready to take action, to to move forward, like Mel and Natalie and uh, and and Sam and, and Simon and the rest of the guys that you saw on the the, the photos and testimonials from before. Uh, so get over to strengthconditioningmentorship.com forward slash thank you. And anybody who signs up, having filled that form out tonight and signs up either tonight or tomorrow, you will get our 500 quid resource bundle for free as a part of the real signing on bonus, if you like, as they call it in, in professional sport. And I know that there may or may not be some questions there, but if you do have any questions on the mentorship or the webinar, I'm more than happy to, um, to take them and, and, and I'll stay on the line uh, as, as long as it takes to, to get through everything, everything. Um, I'm going to bring Darren back in as well when you're ready, Daz. I'm just going to read through some of this. Oh, yeah, can just you hear me? Just go back to some of the other questions. You hearing yeah, me now? Yeah, I Just go cool. back through some of these questions. Yeah, Daz, can I hear you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Steve's just mentioned about the potentiation. He'd never thought of power followed by power. And it would certainly save time and it'd be more effective. So yeah, give it a go. It, it's it's really the way forward, I think, Steve, on that one. If I'm if I'm honest with you, um, from what I've seen. Callum just said, thank you, fantastic work and info. Appreciate it. It's great to hear. Um, Dave, you've done a great job with Sean. Thank you very much. Sean's one of my sprint cyclists. He's coming up in a week or two, and I know Dave trains with that group as well and uh, Dave's a beast himself he, he's underestimated or he's, he, he's underrated out there he's an absolute animal um, so yeah I think you're right Dave we should probably do a future webinar on the psychology of coaching um, Kelly I think it's Kelly on the line still if you're on the line Kelly I did send you an email back uh, earlier on today, Kelly signed up to the mentorship. Um, so yeah, that you should have that email. Oh, Chris has asked about instalment plans for the mentorship. Yes, we do have a payment instalment plan, so you don't have to pay it all up front at all. Um, you can if you want. So how it works? This it's twenty eight hundred. Sorry, it's twenty four hundred plus VAT. Which equals 2880, and that's the full price. If you pay it off up front, which you're more than welcome to do so, 
that would be 2,500, and you'd obviously therefore save a few hundred quid. So we're well, welcome to to do that. But if you pay installments, how it works is we take a deposit. No matter how you choose to pay, take a deposit of 300 quid, and then it's 286 a month after that. So it'd be 286 every month for nine months, and that's the course. That's how it's paid. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Uh, Robert, recently qualified as a PT, keen to move forward with a mentorship, goal is to open your own gym, and um, yeah, I mean, we don't have, I think your question is related to funding, We the only funding we have is for armed forces, and we've, we're the only company out there that is able to offer our courses to the armed forces and they can get funding for it completely and we were approved last September for that which is great we had a, quite a few people in the forces jump on the course but um, I think the, you're, you're, you're probably better using our instalment option uh, just to help you with that because you know I don't want to I've never ruled anyone out at all for not being able to pay up front it's not that our policy we want to get great people on so if you're keen and you want to fill out the questionnaire form tonight We'll get on the phone and we'll figure out a way for you to make this work. And if you want to play pay an installment, you can do. If you want to put a little bit down up front to reduce the installment price, no problem either. Just give us a shout. Give us a shout. I, I want to get great people on this, so I don't care how you pay. Um, just, just, just let us know what works for you, and we'll figure it out. Rob Lloyd says thank you very much. Tom McCann, thank you very much. Fantastic webinar. Um, any more questions, guys? And um, I'm more than happy to answer as many as I can and stay on the line and, and work work everything out with you if you've got any more questions. Uh, hopefully I've answered most of them. Daz, did you have any? I don't know if I've missed anything ever. Um, there was quite a meaty question in there earlier on, which was, um, I think, mentioning about um, muscle groups and antagonists and so on. Um, to do with power training specifically. It's hidden away in there somewhere. Uh, let me just find it. It was mentioning, um, I think it's from Dominic, yeah? I've got it. How do you incorporate... Uh, so something, let me read this through. It's quite, it is a meaty question. Peak performance projects in the USA that work with top-level NBA players. There's a lot of coordination techniques between power drills to look at re relaxation of the antagonist. What are your thoughts on this and do you have any examples? Um, there has been some research out there on that. So the way we tend to do it is I think I showed an example of work using an antagonist movement, an antagonist exercise to potentiate the agonist movement. So you would use, say, in our example I showed, it was a chin-up or a rope, chi a rope chin to potentiate a vertical pressing movement. And there has been some research on that. To my knowledge, it's not, it's not um, categorical how it works or, or, or what, it, what it would do necessarily, but we've seen some good stuff from it. We've seen some really good transfer from it. Where you do, you might do say like a heavy bench row, and then go into some, or not heavy, but a, a kind of a, an explosive 60 to 80 percent bench row, and then go into doing some sort of med ball power movements or pressing based power movements, even like a an explosive press up, and you get quite a, got a good potentiating effect from doing the antagonist as the as the potentiator, and then driving out through the through the agonist movement. So you're looking at pushing to to target pulling, pulling to target pushing, and doing it overhead or horizontally as well. Um, that's that's what we've done. We've not used any specific relaxation techniques, but ultimately, if you do an ant uh, an antagonistic movement, it obviously does relax the agonist um, a little bit more, ready for them to be explosive. Generally speaking, anyway. I know that that's not kind of a, a categorical statement about how that works as such, but that's how we've done it. And I've just came across another question here from Luke on 
ice hockey. Would ice hockey be the same as or similar as rugby and MMA as there is contact and also needs speed? I think ice hockey definitely would have a, a massive, massive benefit from that type of power training. And if you're using those contact-based supersets, um, specific supersets, bar on the weight on the body weight on the bar, kind of power training loads. I think you'd see a massive benefit from the physicality of your ice hockey players going down that path. I mean, I haven't worked with ice hockey specifically, I have to say, but thinking intuitively, that that is a a collision and contact-based sport that also requires explosiveness. So I think some of the obviously the repeated sprint stuff, as well as the sport-specific supersets, some of the potentiating complexes, and the bar weight on the bar power work as well would work really well for for ice hockey mate for sure yeah. Um, just got a question here from Julie. Do you have a rough estimation of guided learning hours per week? I'm a full-time lecturer in a further education college and would like to improve my industry knowledge and enhance my coaching with football players in Northern Ireland. Well, that's great. It's good to hear from you. We've got quite a few people over in Ireland, Northern Ireland, on the mentorship. And we've got quite a few lecturers as well on the mentorship from not Ireland as such, but, um, but all around the UK. So we, the idea with the mentorship is that Every single hour that you do on it is designed to complement your goals. So, and by that, I, what I mean by that is that because we, it's personalised, it's specific. We send you the coach profile sheet, so you assess yourself and you fill out your goals, and we obviously will give you that personal mentoring throughout. Then it's really designed to to optimise where you want to go with it over the course of that nine months. As, as, a, as a contrast, you'd take something like a degree where you're doing what you're told. You've got to do this module, that module, another module, and you've got to do exactly what you're told. And, it, and you might find that there's a, a lot of conflict in there from what you want to do, what, where you want to go with your own development. So what we do with this mentorship is make sure that everything is in line and not conflicting and therefore complementary with what you want to do. So the first thing I wanted to say is that every hour you spend, you, you probably want to be doing that anyway. You probably want to be doing that anyway because you, you, you want to move forward. Well, we just guide you and streamline that and accelerate it through the mentorship. In terms of specific hours per week, uh, it really, again, depends on where you're at. But as a rough guide, I would say that we would you'd benefit from between two and eight hours per week on it. You could do more depending again if you wanted to, let's say you wanted to open up a gym over the next nine months, well yeah you're going to have to do a little bit more work to, to get everything ready to, to do the research etc etc which would guide you through. If you're looking to, as you, I think you've suggested that you are, looking to enhance your own knowledge and, and improve your coaching with football players, I mean 100% it will tick that box for you. And you could do that alongside your further education lecturing position full time. You could you could do choose how to do it. You can do it early doors and get it out of the way before you even get to work. You can you say right, I'm going to do Saturday mornings on the mentorship because by that time all of the content will be you know uploaded into the portal for you, and then you can ask questions and speak to your mentor about that and specifically and use the group for it. Um, you can do a mixture or a combination of all of those methods. Just whatever works for you. And Daz, we've got people that are kind of doing it every way on the program, haven't we? Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sort of every every sort of combination, really. Um, I think it's, it's just a, a completely sort of flexible program. And we've seen it work so well for people from all different backgrounds in different situations it's it's uh it's just delivering across the board really yeah yeah absolutely so hopefully does that answer your question julie drop us a message and let us know um question from ross here do you have anyone in gloucestershire and really want to get on this just need to get some funds to cover it so i'm not stretched month to month yeah i mean i think 
Gloucestershire. Obviously, we've got Sam and, and Rob in Cornwall, which I mean, I'm in Le I'm in Leeds, so you know, you might my my geography isn't superb here. We've got some people in Bristol, which I know is not too far, and I think we've got somebody in Bath. And that area, obviously, we've got quite a lot of people in the southeast. We've got Russell Jolly, one of our business mentors in Bournemouth, Portsmouth area, Pool area. Um, so we've got quite a good mix of people around that area, Ross. And uh, I think it'll do you really well. I think you'll you'll really enjoy it, and you'll get a hell of a lot from it, just being in that network. And obviously, you could def then sort of build up that Gloucester area, and we'll help you to, to set yourself up there. More so, and, and you know, I know you're doing a great job anyway, but um, but it, but it certainly will connect the dots for you as well. And um, on a funding perspective, yeah, I mean, I get I get that it's an investment, and and it should be an investment. You know, it's not something that deliberately it's not 200 quid. You know, you can't get that level of depth and and that level of the process for 200 quid. You know, it's just not going to happen. But um, it's the price is, is still massive, massive value for what you get. And when you think about where you could be at at the end of it, is in comparison to say, you know, the degree option, which is nine grand a year for three years. I mean, it's just another level. And um, the reality is that you know you're probably going to get so much out of this from being in the program and being around our mentors, and, and obviously just just driving yourself forward. I know you do a lot now, and and, and I've, it's great that you, you're involved in it and whatnot. I think it'll just take you to another level. I really do. I think it'll be quality um, for you. But you know, take a take a think about it. And if you're interested, let's get on the phone, uh, fill out your questionnaire tonight. Um, Julie said, "Yep, thanks for that." She's up. We've answered the questions. That's good. And Julie, I think again for you, if you could just fill out that questionnaire tonight, so you, you obviously get the bundle, and we'll. We'll connect either tonight or tomorrow. Um, so yeah, Ross, yeah, go for it, mate. I, I'd love to have you on the program. I, I know you, you, you've all, you've always been a, a follower and, and involved in what I do as well, and I think that's that's great. And I know you're doing some great stuff yourself, so I think would help would help you out a lot there. Uh, Paul has asked, what are your views concerning nutrition in relation to strength training? I mean, it's it's critical, you know, it really is, and um, especially when I would I would say not strength, I'd say performance, and without question, it it's it's a huge part of the puzzle. We do cover it, but deliberately not in in massive depth because you can't be a specialist at everything. So there are good courses out there, but without question, it's important to have. A good working knowledge of nutrition to to educate and, and inform your athletes and clients, and also to have a good network of experts that you can refer people to. So we've got, I know Phil Woodland was on the line a bit a, a little bit ago. Uh, I'm not sure if he is now, but Phil is a nutritionist who's on the mentorship for his S and C knowledge. We've got half a dozen nutritionists on the mentorship that are again doing really well. And they've got their own businesses, they've got their own consulting work, but they obviously want to fill in the gaps with the S and C, and and they've helped to to add value back. So you know you, you obviously will be connecting with good people, and that's what it's about when you're forming a taking your game to the next level is to have great people there that you can fire a question off to say what are your thoughts on that, what what do you think I should do next, and that's what it's all about. So um, you know. Definitely nutrition is important there. Uh, any more questions, guys? I know it's late, and I, I know we're uh, rolling on a little bit later than, than anticipated, but um, but yeah, we'll uh, we'll answer all of those questions. Anything for you there, from you there, Daz? Um, Annie, just if anyone's got any questions specifically whilst I'm on on this right now, you know, I, I did the mentorship myself originally uh, back in the early days when it was a little bit less structured but um, you know even still I've, I've experienced it and done it so if you've got any questions around that I'll be open and honest with with any answers I mean as far as um, the the one the one thing I normally say to people about 
a quick summary sort of in one in one kind of paragraph about what the difference it made to me really was um I've worked closely within sort of a track and field environment and um I remember going to a, a really good uh annual conference for England Athletics at Lee Valley um and I just started doing the mentorship literally and I think sort of about a day later I was at this annual conference and it was brilliant it was really exciting really good speakers and I remember thinking wow you know one day I'd love to be able to actually be up there doing stuff like that and um things went really really well with the mentorship I worked really hard but got amazing support and uh, built a brilliant network doors got opened and honestly the very next year I presented at the annual conference and I was standing next to like Rasmus Ankerson I'd read his book the gold mine effect and then and then I was presenting in the morning and afternoon to to loads of coaches there, you know, and in, in a room with loads of kind of people that I really look up to. So that was really cool for me. And that was kind of like we've seen that across the board with so many people on the mentorship, even just since this January that have been with us. You know, things start to happen and then more and more opportunities keep cropping up, really. So I don't know, don't know what your thoughts are sort of adding to that, Brendan, but that's really just sort of from me having sort of been and done it for real kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's good. It's, it's good to get your first-hand thoughts, Daz. And for me, it goes back to those that toolbox. You know, we, we do give you the tools. So without question, be a, a, a better version of yourself nine months down the line. And if, if you're a better version of yourself, you have a, therefore have an ability to shape what that looks like. So whether it's you, you focus a lot on your business or whether you focus a lot on networking to to get into pro sport or whether you focus a lot on the fundamentals of coaching or all three. You do have the opportunity to, to completely shape that with our mentorship. But I think we give you those tools, but I think overriding that is being around a community of people that are just intent on succeeding themselves. And that is fantastic because we all have bad days. We all have those days where we don't feel like doing it. And you know, like I put put these presentations together and hype myself up for it. And and I love presenting to you. But you know, it's not it's not like I feel fantastic every day. And, and it's the, and it's the same for all of us. And and so you, you know, you saw on the program some of those the webinar tonight, some of those testimonials from Facebook, from Mel and Natalie, and you know, they're great examples of people that have really really benefited from being in that community of people that therefore goes above the sets and reps and above the the tools that you're getting and just gets into being in, in, in the company of, of good people that have got like-minded goals and you can bounce ideas off and they can pick you up and, and, and help you when you're struggling with things and you know that's that's what this mentorship's about really. It's it's more than it's more than giving you strength and conditioning knowledge. It's a lot, lot more and as Mel said you know, it's a full-on personal development program that really gets you to shape where you want to go with your future. And you know, you've seen it yourself, Daz, firsthand. You know, it's not—it's totally genuine. Daz started off a mentorship. Now he's working with GB athletes, and he's—you know—he's done a fantastic job. And Daz has come in and worked. He's working full-time for strength and conditioning education because he believes in it. It's not because you know we. Of any other reason, it's 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 that he's been through the process, and it, you know he's he's helping me out because he's he's great at things that I'm not great at, but he's first and foremost benefited and, and been through the process. And he knows exactly what it's about, and can share, you know, categorical knowledge now at a high level with with coaches at a high level, and and present and mix with with great coaches, and you know that's we see that time and time again. And I think there's a lot of confidence that comes from being around those people that mean that you think, you know what, I can get that gym open. I will do it. I'm going to make that happen. Or, you know what, I'm going to get that job in pro rugby or pro football or elite sport. I'm going to make it happen. You know, and, and that is what it's about. You know, that's how it shortcuts things so much. Um, I think that's really my view on it. And I want to just wanted to say is that 
you know, we will, this course is May the 11th start date and it's so powerful that the end of this year you'll be in a completely different position. You know, if, if, you've, if you're ready for it, then we want to chat to you and we want you to, to, to get on the phone, we want you to fill that form out because we, we've had 150 applications for 30 spaces but we want to get the best 30 people possible and um, and I, you know I know for a fact that I know the names on this line there's, there's some great great people listening in that that, that will I'm, I'm having touch base with some people before and whatnot I know that it will be fantastic so as a group of people I know it will be fantastic for, for you guys listening in so you know please do take that five minutes to fill out the questionnaire form tonight because we can then give you a 500 quid bonus, send you a lot of videos when you signed up for, for nothing and really just take things to that next level and you know we've improved as a process over the last few years just like an athlete improves and a, and a business improves we've grown and we've got everything nailed and it's so smooth now and we've got new mentors coming in like I said people like Duncan, Stuart Ewell, uh, Jared Deacon and, and the rest of the guys and that it's just a ridiculous high level that uh, as a process we've even got people in, in Australia and America that are looking to take on the mentorship as a you know partner up with us and deliver that mentorship out there you know and it's very very flattering but um, it's it's just cool to have to have people in the mix you know so um, yeah let's uh, let's see if there's any more questions Daz um, and uh, we can call time if there's no more questions I know we've had I'm just checking my email here on my phone I know we've had a few forms come in that well, what I can see. Um, any more questions come in, Daz? No, it looks like we're all done now. Daz is falling yeah. asleep. Now, uh, can you hear me now? I've got you. I've got you. Cool. Yeah, I think now I think everybody's brains are fried now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Let's. Um, Let's call time there, and um, and we'll we'll touch base again. We've got a, another w webinar on Thursday night, um, which is the same webinar. So if you want to watch this again on Thursday night, you're more than welcome to join us. Uh, it will be I'll you know talk not exactly word for word, but but a similar structure. And um, yeah, let's let's uh, let's let's call uh, call time there, Daz. And thanks for listening, everyone. Thank you very, very much, and um, we can take it take it forward. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. No worries. Thanks, guys.